Okay, so you've got your dried stored nuts and now you are wanting to get the kernels out of the shells. If you're starting out and just doing a small batch, um, you can you can crack with a hammer. You definitely need to sort of get the weight right so you're not just like smashing everything and then having to pick little bits out. I've used this quite a bit. This is a, pecan, a hand pecan cracker. These are called a rocket pecan cracker. I've found these in thrift stores for $5 all over our area. The way those Miwok ladies do it is with a rock, like two rocks, that's it. Um, so as you scale up, this tool that Dave built is definitely recommended. Uh, these are, uh, I think they've gone up in price a little bit. I think they're like 180 bucks with shipping or something like that. Uh, but they're made by this little family owned company in California, very high quality tool. I've been using this, you know, I've, I've definitely processed over a thousand pounds of flour through this thing as well as hazelnuts. Totally, it's still totally fine. So yeah, it's got a nice big hopper. You feed the nuts in, uh, you crank them through and they pour out. But again, I would not recommend this unless you're at that point where you're like, okay, I'm gonna process a five pound batch every week for the next two months. At that point, this is gonna save you a lot of time. One question, when you harvest your acorn, they still have the cap on. Um, well, actually, so if with most acorns, the ones that fall to the ground and still have the cap attached are usually bad. Most acorns will drop free of the cap when they're ripe and the tree is wanting to drop them. There are some exceptions. There's a species bur, bur oak that grows through a large part of the US. They have these crazy frilly enclosed caps that are kind of a pain to deal with. Um, that's, I'll talk a little bit more about these later, but that's a, sort of another species too. Um, but yeah, I don't wind up dealing with caps because the ones attached are not desirable. So, so once you've cracked your nuts, so if you're cracking one at a time, it's very simple to extract the kernel. You just crack it, you pull the kernel out, you put those into a bowl. If you're doing this, the step after this is removing a lot of kernels from a lot of shells. So again, it's sort of a matter of scale. Once you get to a certain point, this becomes more efficient. If you're just doing one small batch, this is actually less efficient. So when you're pulling out your kernels, the main thing you want to be looking for, so obviously you're separating out kernels from shells. The other thing you're doing is another quality control step where you're removing any sort of mold or spoilage. Oh, that one's good. Okay, so basically any kernel that's got a color on it that is not a shade of brown is not good. So anything, I call it fungal white, which if you've ever seen mycelia of any kind is like a bright, vibrant white or yellow or green or blue, any of that is bad. You don't want that in your food at all. Any shade of brown up into black is totally fine. Um, the kernels when they're fresh will usually be like a cream color, um, but then they'll dry out to more of sort of, this is a pretty good example, any of those shades that's on there would be totally fine. Even if the whole kernel is totally black, still totally fine. Basically that just means it dried really fast and so it oxidized on that outside, but when you crack it open, the whole inside's gonna be fine. So this one is totally good. Okay. I was trying to find a bad one, but we'll see. Okay, that's a pretty good example. Okay, so you can see with that, see that sort of fuzzy white? Yeah. That's old dried up mold, you don't want that. And then all of that bumpy stuff, that's all larva frass. So that's bug poop. Uh, you don't want that stuff. 
The bug poop itself is not harmful. It's just acorn kernel. The issue is that that frass is very conducive to the growth of those molds and funguses that are producing aflatoxin. Which again, so aflatoxin is the most carcinogenic natural compound that's ever been studied. You definitely don't want to eat it. But the caveat I like to add about that is that there is aflatoxin in all grocery store food. That's the reality of the world we live in. So a lot of people die of cancer. It's very likely that's a major vector of that. So there's a little larva. So that's what you're gonna see crawl out of the nuts. So that's a two year old larva. If you spend a lot of time looking at these kernels, it becomes very obvious which ones are food and which ones are not. The main issue is that learning curve of like, if you've never handled your staple foods, you know what I mean? It's a, it's a, it's a step to sort of figure out. Oscar, do you know if those were um, kiln dried or were they in the house? These were kiln dried, yeah. And so you can see, so that's why these are, these, so if you dry on racks, like I was showing, versus a kiln, they'll tend to be a little more like cream colored, lighter colored a little bit. They also won't be quite so brittle. Like you can see this one just cracked before it even came out. They tend to won't do that if they were dried slower. I have a question. So you said the aflatoxin comes from the mold growing on insect grass. Uh -huh. So if you, kiln dried these, wouldn't that have... Um... Well, some of the stuff going into the kiln already had the issues going on. The other thing is like if a kernel was pretty well damaged when it went into the kiln, that hot environment for the first four to eight hours is actually really awesome for growing mold. Um, so that's where that sort of, you know what I mean? There's definitely a margin in there. Um, so again, it comes down to scale though. If you're harvesting 500 pounds, you're gonna wind up with better yield even with that little percent that got cultured with mold, basically. Does that make sense? But you still really want to avoid eating or mixing those nuts into your flour. Yes. Yeah, I mean, you definitely, uh, yeah, you definitely want to avoid aflatoxin. Um, and so that's, you know, even processing on a sort of small commercial scale, I do eight pound batches of flour at a time. And uh, the way that I've sort of broken it down to, to, you know, for the labor cost issues is I spend one third of the labor harvesting and drying one third of the labor is cracking and leaching and all the sort of random processing. One third of the labor is removing kernels from shells and mold. So that is the bulk, you know, like the, that's the largest single step that there is. Um, and it's definitely time consuming, but it's, you know, like I sit around and watch YouTube or Netflix or whatever, or hang out with my two year old she loves to help me. She can't differentiate what's what. She likes to just throw the acorns into the bowl that I'm trying to, you know, selectively uh, pull stuff out into. But um, yeah, but yeah, it's definitely the time consuming step. If you're running it through that machine that you have there that's like deshelling it, uh -huh. isn't that just, I mean, it's so much just the mold would just kind of go out well, the stuff, stuff that's been dried well enough, even if there is mold in there, it's not active mold. So it's like, it's like that stuff I showed you that's like, it's all dried out. So that mold's dead. So, uh... I was thinking like the powder of it, just kind of like getting on it. Right. I mean, there definitely is some in there, but so like even, uh, so like in the kiln dried stuff, when I crack out and remove all the mold, it's like at the worst, it would be like 10% of the total. So at least from what I've seen, it doesn't seem to be doing that. Um, yeah. Uh, I guess, so I'll pass around a red oak kernel that's dried. 
Uh, red oaks generally have a lot less of those issues. So again, uh, white oaks are really great in a lot of ways for learning. But if you start processing a lot of acorns, red oaks are a lot more efficient, a lot more storable, and nutritionally better. My suspicion with that is that because there's so much, there's so much more fat in it, there's less water in it to begin with, so there's just less habitat for mold. Another step I would mention is that once, so once I scaled up a bunch, when I'm removing kernels, before the hand step of removing everything and pulling out the mold, I take a three inch wide, three foot long piece of PVC and put a shop vac in the top of it and run it over that pile of nuts. And so that sucks out probably about 90% of the shells. So again, once you reach that certain scale, that's definitely a improvement. Um, yeah, okay. So you pull all those kernels out. So that shop vac is basically a winnowing thing. That's, I've seen videos from uh, like old folks in Korea doing it with just like wick, wicker baskets where they've got this technique down where they just throw everything up and all the shells sort of move up to the top of the basket and then they just sort of shuffle them out and then keep going and by the end it's just kernels in the basket. Is there anything you can do with like the nuts floating versus the shell or like the nuts sinking versus shells floating? Or? From what I've seen it tends to not, white oaks when they're dried are pretty light and so it's not a perfect thing. You know, you'll wind up getting some shells that sink and some kernels that float and so it's just, um, the other thing is that if you've wet everything and you then still have to do a hand step, it kind of just makes all that more messy and tedious. Okay, so you've pulled out all your kernels. You then want to soak them in water to fully rehydrate them. So we dried them out to make them easier to crack. Now we're gonna rehydrate them to make them easier to grind. So uh, I soak them in water for overnight. You, you know, the sort of rhythm that I've gotten down is I'll process a batch throughout an evening, I'll put them in water overnight, and then the next morning they're ready to grind. Um, and so that grinding, I, you know, the traditional way to do this was stone, mortar and pestle. Um, the way I do it is in a Vitamix. So I take those, those fully rehydrated nuts, put them in the Vitamix about halfway, fill up with water, and then grind down to a slurry. Does that make sense to folks? Any sort of food processor, will work. Um, I, so I've seen people try and I get a lot of questions about using a grain mill for grinding down. Uh, from what I've seen and heard, most the, so the highest fat that most grain mills want you to put through them is like four to 5%. And even white oaks tend to be higher than that. So most of the time you're gonna make some kind of weird acorn butter if you do that. Um, and you're gonna clog up your grain mill. So I don't recommend that. The other thing is that because we're going to water leach the end product, using water to hydrate and lubricate the grinding just makes sense. Okay, so we grind up into a slurry. Then that slurry is what we're going to leach. So there's Three methods for leaching. And so like with all of these things, I, there's one method that I recommend as a intro beginner scale method, and that's hot leaching. Um, and then there's sort of a mid scale and then a later scale. So let's talk about hot leaching. So uh, the way to do this is uh, so essentially what you're doing is you're boiling the 
acorn meal in changes of water until it's done. Um, so I'll explain in a minute what until it's done means. So what you want to do is have a large pot of boiling water. You want to have a smaller pot that's about half full of boiling water. You're going to pour the meal into the small pot of boiling water. You're going to boil it for about a minute until that water is black. You're going to pour that into a colander, refill the small pot with hot water, and then put the meal back into the boiling water. It's important to keep that water hot the whole time. If you put, if you just put it back into cold water and then heat it all up together, it tends to lock, it makes this sort of cap on the exterior and kind of locks in the tannin. It makes it harder to fully leach out. You want to keep it hot because it just keeps all those pores nice and open. Um, with white oaks, you're gonna do that, you're gonna use somewhere between two and four changes of water. But again, you're gonna do it until it's done. So what until it's done means for me is if I take a spoonful of that meal and put it in my mouth and chew it up completely until it's liquid and I do not get an astringent spit urge during that, then it's done. And so uh, that what I'm talking about, the spit urge is not because it's like gross, disgusting taste. Astringency, so a lot of people say acorns are bitter. They're not actually bitter, they're astringent. So the tannin is tightening up your mouth, which makes you produce saliva and makes you want to spit. So if you get that sensation, then they're not done. If you can chew them up until they're totally liquid and it just kind of tastes like bland wheat meal or something, that's kind of what you're going for. Does that make sense? Okay. The colander you would use for that, would that just be like a mesh colander, not like a one with holes so that the... It's gonna depend on what you're using to grind and how finely down you ground. Uh, you could, so what I use for leaching, what you could use for this is you, it, you know, if you're grinding it down really fine, you're going to have to do less boiling, which is good, but you would then want to like line a colander with a cloth or something. So you'd retain that. Yeah. But yeah, definitely. However, your grinding needs to sort of be tuned to whatever sort of stuff you're using. And we'll talk about that more in another leaching method too. Does that make sense though? So the reason that I recommend that as the best sort of beginner 101 method is that everybody has the tools to accomplish that in their kitchen right now. If you don't, then you're probably never gonna make this happen. But that's very accessible, easy to do method. Um, the issue with it is that you are cooking the acorns right then. So you're caramelizing their starches, which means that when you go to try to use them, their binding ability is basically nothing. So you're gonna have to use some other substance to get them to actually hold together. If you can keep them cold throughout the leaching process, their starch will to some degree bind with itself. Like you'll see with our pizza dough, it's the only binder in there is the acorn starch and egg. There are a lot of, you know, a lot of the sort of books and stuff I've seen recommend uh, using it as 50% of a wheat recipe, which is definitely a viable thing. And you can make basically any wheat recipe and just substitute 50% acorn. Um, but if you're, you know, a fanatic like me and you want 100% pure, you got to keep it cold. Okay, and so then what you would do with that boiled acorn, we'll kind of cover what you do with the leached meal after we talk about all the methods. Does that make sense? Basically, we're gonna dry out that meal and then grind it down into finer flour.